Hey guys, welcome to Sermon Based Small Groups. I made the mistake this weekend of um, we had church, then Foundry 201, and then a piano recital, and the room was like 80 degrees and classical music playing. So if I fall asleep during this video, I apologize, but man, I'm kind of chilled out here. So welcome to Sermon Based Small Groups. Hopefully I don't lull you to sleep this week. Well, this past week, we're in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. I used an opening story about uh, Julius Caesar and his quadruple triumph, which a triumph in Rome was this huge parade celebrating a military victory. Uh, he had just finished four uh, massive campaigns and won them all. And he had this huge triumph where he gave away tens of millions of dollars. He threw gold into the streets to the tune of 10 tons of gold by the, in the form of coins thrown out to the people watching. He was a conquering king and he was bringing back the spoils of war. He had gone off and faced the terrifying enemies of the Northern people, the Gaulish people, so French border of Germany. He had gone and faced them in battle and not only beaten them, but subdued them and then brought back a ton of war loot. And, um, and so what's really cool about this is Paul writes a letter in, uh, to Ephesians, the church in, in Ephesus, sorry. Um, and what he does is he uses language that would remind these people of a triumph, of a great parade, of a, um, of a conquering king coming back and bringing gifts to his people and letting them know that he faced what was unfaceable. He defeated it and he brought back a victory, but not only a victory, gifts for them. That's what we're talking about this week. So I'd like you to go ahead and um, take a minute and read that scripture. And then I'm going to come back with a quick recap. I don't know if you caught this, but it said um, in verse 7, when he ascended on high, speaking of Jesus, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. I think that's an amazing thing. Paul is really using the language of a triumph in this. And, um, and so we need to look and realize, well, if Jesus did this conquering, what's the gifts he brought back? Well, primarily it's the Holy Spirit. He brought the Holy Spirit, as we see in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit invades the church, and the church goes crazy. And not crazy in a bad way, but really amazing things happen. And what we have to look at is understand that the Holy Spirit is here, and he brings gifts. And there are different kinds of gifts. There's a gift of tongues, which is pretty common in the Old Testament and even common nowadays. There's the gift of prophecy words of knowledge. There's gifts of service. There's gifts of helping people. Some people are gifted with just being generous and they have a gift of giving. Um, some people have a gift um, of leadership and helping people, you know, helping raise up leaders. There are many different gifts going on within the church. And what we recognize is the Holy Spirit gives gifts to us freely and lavishly so that we can live for the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. The Holy Spirit always illuminates the work of Jesus Christ. And in illuminating that work, he shows us that we are called to use our gifts to display Jesus in this world. And our, our gift of the Holy Spirit always promotes unity within the body. There is a unity, even though we're very diverse as Christians, we have a number of different denominations and doctrinal beliefs, but we are unified under the banner of Christ. There's unity to the body and the body is built up by the unification of the Holy Spirit among us. So we recognize that what God's done and doing in the church is bringing together all things under one banner and that is Jesus Christ. We also recognize that it is... Um, it, the church is maturing. We're supposed to be in maturing individually and corporately. And maturity allows us to know that um, sometimes when, we're, when there's a deceptive doctrine being taught, um, like I often like to say like prosperity gospel, my only problem with the prosperity gospel is scripture. Like last I checked, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, not take up your best life now and follow me. Jesus called us to a life of um, faithful devotion to him, not the comforts of this life. So what we look at is there's a maturity in the spiritual gift that, that 
in this gift of the spirit that helps raise us up and mature us into a body that understands the value of being unified, of growing up into all things into him who is the head of the church, that is Jesus, and who understands the art, and I think it's an art and a discipline of speaking the truth in love. When we speak the truth in love, we can say something difficult and painful, but we do it for the benefit of the hearer. Truth without love is usually cruel and unkind, you know? Uh, there's a number of different ways to kind of give an analogy to it, but just think of it. If you look at somebody say, hey, you know, does this shirt make me look fat? And they're like, no, but your face does. That's kind of harsh. It may be true, but it's harsh and there's no love in it, right? If you said to someone, um, if you had love with no truth, you could tell someone, no, you're the greatest in the world at that. And they could be terrible at it, but you just don't want to be uncomfortable in telling them the truth. So you deceive them to think they're doing okay at something maybe they're really bad at. So the reality is telling the truth in love is a discipline and an art that the church needs to be maturing in because Paul um, refers to it in Ephesians chapter four, and we need to recognize its value. So the church needs to know that all believers are given a gift of the Holy Spirit. Some, like Billy Graham, evangelism is a gift. Billy Graham was off the charts with evangelism. But you may just sit across the table from one person and have a smaller portion of the gift of evangelism and share your faith with them. It doesn't matter how big or little your gift is, it's what you do with it. It's what you do with it. It's also important to note that um, for us, that we need to not fail to speak the truth in love. We can't pretend that the world around us who doesn't know Jesus isn't going to hell. How do we tell them the gospel in love for them not to point out their moral flaws? We are here to be the people of God growing in unity, in purity, and peace so that the triumph of Christ, the great parade of the Christian church making Jesus famous is one that is mature, it is unified, and it is focused on doing one thing, making famous the one who died for our sins and redeemed us from a broken past into a beautiful future. My friends, we're going to ask some questions now for Sermon Bay Small Groups. Take a minute and answer this question. What has Jesus conquered? What has Jesus conquered? It could be very simple. It could be complex things. It could be personal or corporate. Take a minute. Answer the question. What has Jesus con conquered? Question number two, when you hear the term gifted, what do you think of? So when you hear that term gifted, what comes to mind? Talk amongst you and your friends. It's time for you to be Webster's dictionary and do me a favor, okay? I need you to pull a solid here. Define unity in your words for people to understand. What does unity mean? Have you ever heard someone say, oh, that's so immature? By the way, I hear that quite a bit. <laughs> it just happens in my life. But have you ever heard that? Someone's like, oh, that's so immature. And, and it just kind of hurts. But let me ask this. How does immaturity, how does being immature make everyday life more difficult? Can you give me an example from your own past where someone spoke the truth to you without love? Think about that. Like just ponder it. It probably doesn't take long to remember when somebody said something that was true, but lacking love, it was probably pretty painful. Think of a time that that happened. In our faith tradition, we commit ourselves to all things that make for unity, for purity, and for peace. I think unity matters in the church. I think the purity of the church matters, that we are devoted to making one famous, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it really um, is given evidence that that's happening when there's peace 
among the people of God. It doesn't mean everything's easy and nice and rosy, but it means we're difficult. We're, we're able to have difficult conversations where maybe it's a little painful, but it's worthwhile. I want to challenge you this week as you talk amongst your friends and different things, commit yourself to never exalting you, but exalting Jesus Christ. Commit yourself to the art and discipline of speaking the truth with love and commit yourself to discerning what are my gifts and how do I live this out? In case you're wondering, how do we, how do we as a small group find out what our gifts are, what gifts God gave to us? I want to invite you to something. I would love for you to go to Foundry 201. It's a class we host it. It's three different short classes. You get a meal and we have great conversation. One of the things we do is we unpack and do spiritual gift assessments and we find out what unique gifts God gave you that allow you to be a person who's always pointing and making him famous. We would love for you to be part of that class. If you're interested, it'd be cool. Sign up as a small group. We'd love to host you and help you find out who you are and what you were created for in this life. Friends, have yourself a great day. I'm going to probably go listen to classical music and put a wet spot on a pillow.